Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Midday Live on TV3 with me, Martin Esiedu Dati. This bulletin is coming to you from our studio here at Adesanwe in Accra. Coming up within the next one hour. Dozens of protesters of coalition for national sovereignty clash with the police in the Ashanti region after defying their orders during a demonstration. Also coming up, government's white paper rejects Ayasu West Wogan recommendation to prosecute Suleimana Mohammed, who slapped some George. And on the international front, Belgian Air Force F-16 fighter plane crashes in France. Thank you very much for staying with us. Uh, details of our stories. Now, we are starting from the Ashanti region because dozens of protesters um, this morning defied police orders to demonstrate against the current administration over the handling of the economy. Now, information we have indicated that the Coalition for National Sovereignty claimed the police systematically decided to block them from exercising their democratic right, a claim the law enforcers have refuted. William Evans Incom has been following the unmanned demonstration in the Ashanti region and has been chronicling the unfolding event. Deputy General Secretary of the largest opposition party in the country, the NDC, Peter Utukono, has been granting media with an interview stating categorically clear that they will still continue with their demonstration, even if the police the police are not ready to protect them. Mr. Tukono, I thank you very much for your time. You are saying that you will continue the demonstration despite the fact that the police are not ready to protect you because you failed to inform them. No, the police not being ready to protect us is not the basis for anybody to either do demonstration or not. The law stipulates clearly, give them ample notice beyond five days. We have done that over a month ago. The regional commander, we have agreed with him. I hear he's on leave. There is a new TIC. And the two IC is taking instructions from whoever is from above in government and telling them that they shouldn't allow us. So we come here, we start a demonstration. In the middle of the demonstration, you bring us letter that you, you, you don't allow, you will not allow us to do the demonstration. Who does that? And which law applies in this case? What we are saying is that we are ready, willing, and able to protect ourselves. If they are unable to protect us, we will protect ourselves. I, I, and we embark on a peaceful I have seen a number of... And we have always done this demonstration very peacefully. I have seen a number of police vehicles here. I have seen a number of personnel here. Are they not here to protect you? Exactly. So if they are here to protect us, then what is the bone of contention? So the demonstration is on. So they will protect us. And we know that they will do their job diligently. No, I'm asking this because you also said that a letter has been given to you to halt the demonstration. The letter is an advice and you can choose to pick the advice or not. The demonstration by the Coalition for National Sovereignty has started but without police protection. Earlier, the Deputy General Secretary of the MDC, Peter Otukona, has insisted that with or without police support, they will still go ahead with this demonstration. And that's exactly what we are saying on the principal streets of Kumasi. A number of inscriptions have been effected on the placards. For instance, open your Mohammed's Kiritian market now. I have seen fraudulent and Azar school placements and also Fawana government governments among other inscriptions on placards. We will be speaking to Bernard, uh, Bernard Mona. Bernard Mona is the chairman of the uh, PNC and he will be telling us about the security. So Bernard Mona, now you don't have the police. How well are you protecting yourself as far as this particular demonstration is concerned? We are embarking on our human rights as enshrined in the law. The police were properly notified. The regional commander of the police received the notification, assured us that they will put everything in place to secure our demonstration. The regional 2IC decides that he is above his regional boss, is taking instructions ostensibly to undermine his regional boss, 
and now has come this morning to tell us that we should reroute our decision and that they were advising us. We have not taken your advice. So why are you running away from your duties as a police? This is very irresponsible of a police service that expects people to abide by laws. Because if you advise somebody, advice is not compulsory. Advice is not by force. And you are advising us to reroute. If we decline your advice, it doesn't mean that you should check your responsibility. This is the most vulgar policing I have seen in my life. And if this is the police service that our nation have, then we are in crisis. I don't have the security at the moment because I haven't seen a single policeman following this particular demonstration. But they said they are their own security men and they are going to ensure that this one passes without a hitch. So we are still on the streets, on the principal streets. They are not presenting any petition, but they will be addressing the gathering at the Jubilee Park where this particular demonstration commenced. And that's William Evans saying come in the Ashanti region. So we swing back to the Greater Accra region, straight to the office of the president, because the Commission of Inquiry into the Ayawasu West Wogan by election violence has recommended that Minister of State in charge of national security, Brian Echampong, be reprimanded in authorizing an operation that led to the mayhem at the polling station. The white paper to the report, which is yet to be published, also recommended that the SWAT commander, DSP Samuel Azugu, be removed. Here's a report. DSP Samuel Azugu was in charge of operations at Baalishim polling station on the day of the Ibai election. The Mill Short Commission in the report said DSP Azugu failed to properly command and control his men. The members of the commission want DSP Azugu's removal to be immediate and recommended the Inspector General of Police to reassign him. The commission recommended the Director of Operations at the National Security, Colonel Mike Opoku, be reprimanded for being ultimately responsible for the outcome of the SWAT operation. At least 16 persons were injured after some national security operatives invaded the residence of the NDC parliamentary candidate with the belief that he had a stockpile of arms. All right, so we've been following this particular report since the commission presented it to the president. And uh, interestingly, there are a number of recommendations that we want to take you through them. They would speak to uh, security analyst Adam Bonner to find out whether or not uh, these recommendations, as per the commission's um, you know, work, is something feasible that the, uh, the government should follow. So top of the uh, recommendations for us will be the fact that this man in question, Emmanuel Akumia, who... Uh, when the commission met, came and was known as double, look at those biceps, said that um, the commission is recommending that the criminal prosecution be taken against Mr. Ernest Akumia alias double for the unauthorized possession of firearms under section 192 clause 1 of the Criminal Offenses Act. It goes on to say that this man in question, who is uh, Mohammed Suleimana, he slapped the Member of Parliament for Ningo Pram Pram, Sam George. Now, the Commission recommends that criminal prosecution be taken against Mohamed Suleimana for the offence of assault to wait the slapping of Sam George, MP for Ningo Pram Pram. This is um, Samuel Azugu. The Commission recommends the immediate removal of DSP Samuel Azugu from command responsibility at the Ministry of National Security given his failure to appropriately command and control the SWAT team of which he had charge during the operation at the Labaolishi School Polling Station. It also recommends that he uh, be reassigned by the IGP. This is Colonel Mike Opoku. The commission is recommending that uh, Mr. Michael Poku, or Colonel Michael Poku, be re reprimanded for being ultimately responsible for the outcome of the SWAT operations at the Labaolishi polling station. His liability is further reinforced by his failure to properly define the mission for which the SWAT team was sent. Further, he failed to conduct an internal inquiry into identifying the culprits of the offense when revelations became rife that there were operational lapses resulting in violations for human 
Right. And just in case you do not know who exactly he is, he's the Director of Operations at the National Security. Uh, still on him, the Commission also added that uh, they recommend that Kenolopoku be made to immediately release the weapons that were used there at the polling station, as well as the persons involved uh, in that operation to enable ballistic testing and analysis to be undertaken and for further investigations to be undertaken by the police. This is Mr. Brian Champong. The commission recommends that Mr. Brian Champong be reprimanded for his ultimate responsibility as minister in authorizing an operation of that character on a day of an election in a built-up area. And uh, finally, uh, so that is one of the recommendations, or a few of them. We also have a number of the recommendations that we couldn't capture here, but it is still in that report. And uh, we want to take you through them briefly and quickly. One of them is that the Minister of State appointed at the presidency uh, to the Ministry of uh, National Security should have a clearly defined role uh, delineated with responsibilities indexed to that of the substantive sector minister. There seem to be a number of layers of security officers and the commission is recommending that their roles should be clearly defined so they do not uh, uh, usurp that, uh, the power of either of the, their colleagues. Furthermore, the commission recommends that no masked or hooded men be used for civilian policing, especially in electoral policing or the execution of intelligence contingent on or connected with any ongoing election in Ghana. Clearly, the problem that many people had was that this SWAT team you are seeing on your screens right now, when they got there, they had put masks on their faces. And what that did was it scared the people the more. So the commission says no masked or hooded men be used for civilian policing. Also, the commission recommends that SWAT teams and police officers deployed to maintain the peace and order on electoral grounds must have rigorous training in crowd control, arrests, and perimeter security for both ongoing electoral exercises and for any other allied uh, security issues that may emerge in an ancillary fashion. The Commission further recommends that standard rules and procedures for the issuance of weapons and ammunition to police officers and operatives of the national security who are sent on missions and accompanying rules of accountability for these weapons and ammunition must be enforced. And you will recall that in the last few days there has been a conversation as to whether or not police officers be given weapons when especially those that are doing the MTTD jobs. Should they be given weapons? Shouldn't they? The commission is saying that if you're going to give them, be sure that you've trained them properly before you hand them weapons. In the final bit, it says the commission recommends that the police should mount public education on crime scene management to ensure that the public would avoid interfering with crime scenes and thereby protect the integrity of evidence for further prosecution. And uh, finally, the commission recommends that an independent police complaints commission based outside the police structure be established to deal with complaints from the public on the conduct of police officers and so promote police accountability. And uh, those are the two key things uh, that have asked, you know, that stand out for me when, when it comes to the number of the recommendations that have been made. We'll be talking to Mr. Adam Bona uh, shortly, but you'd also want to go to our website, 3 We have the full recommendations from the commission there. You might want to grab it and then read to get to know what other recommendations were made. Let's go and talk to Mr. Adam Bona right now. He's a security analyst and also uh, has been following this particular development quite closely. Mr. Bona, good afternoon to you and thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm sure that you've seen or also heard the, some of the reports that were made, that, the recommendations that have been made. What are your initial reactions to some of the recommendations? Right. So good afternoon to your viewers. Well, my initial recommendations has to do with the fact that, uh, or my uh, initial comment has to do with, uh, to do with the recommendation, has to do with, uh, the, the the report itself it looks a bit vague uh, for some of the very important uh, elements. For instance, if uh, the commission recommended that uh, Brian Honourable Brian Achampong, Colonel uh, Opoku, and uh, a few of them be reprimanded, if you say reprimanded, that uh, in simple terms is too vague. Mm. I mean, reprimand could be 
just give them uh, you know a query letter and it ends there and so looking at the severity of uh, you know the what took place one would have wanted the commission to be very firm and also go direct and say either dismiss them or move them from that uh, role completely but that was not done we they rather recommended that they be reprimanded reprimanded i mean it's too vague but if you look at uh, dsp azugu for instance there again they said dsp azugu should be moved and reassigned but nothing was uh, said about whether he should be punished i'm not sure if moving him amounts to being punished because dsp azugu uh, this uh, whole commission uh, was uh, telecasted. We all watched it. Uh, he lied. I mean, and therefore, if you lie to a commission like that, he should have been cited for perjury. But that has not been done. I was also expecting that the commission would actually uh, re require that uh, DSP Azugu, apart from uh, some of these recommendations I wanted to see, be uh, made to undergo training. Mm. DSP Azugu lacks policing, ethics, and training. And therefore, uh, apart from being moved, because if you move him, you are only going to create a mess at, uh, you know, the, the station is going to be going to or wherever he's going to be going to. Therefore, he needs to be trained. And so, uh, and uh, what is it? Uh, the the young, the, the gentleman who slapped... Yeah, Suleiman uh, Mohammed. Yeah, who slapped uh, Honorable Sam George. I think that the... It wasn't even up to the commission to recommend that he's prosecuted, but of course they are doing their work. We all know that uh, if you slap, uh, it's criminal. If you slap somebody just like that, it's criminal. Mm. And therefore, he should by now have been facing uh, having his day in court. And also, the double who took the gun from uh, the one of the police officers, and according to him, fired a single bullet. I mean, we know uh, if you are not licensed to handle a weapon, mm. you are not supposed to use it. And this is a state weapon he took, according to him. Right. And therefore, he's been recommended for, uh, what do you call it, prosecution, which I think is good. But what I want to see is that he should be uh, prosecuted using the new uh, vigilantism and other uh, related offenses law. No, okay. Within that law, it says that there is no the option of a fine. Because I suspect that we might have a situation where he has his day in court. And uh, if they don't use the new vigilantism or related offenses act to prosecute, uh, law to prosecute him. But he's for, going for to those. Go home with a fine. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Bonner, for those who have been. Uh, for those whose names have been specifically mentioned, uh, like you talked about Suleiman and Mohammed, uh, DSP Azugu, etc., do you think that the punishments or the recommendations made are punitive enough. In the case of Suleiman and Mohammed, we are even told that the white paper seemed to exonerate him, that no action will be taken against him. Do you think that if a recommendation is made by a commission set up by the president is not followed, what does that tell us as a people? I can, I can only smile and say that uh, what it means is that uh, if a member of parliament accost me, I should be able to slap him. That's what literally means. It means that, uh, our, unfortunately, members of parliament would have to ready themselves because if the gentleman who slapped the uh, Honorable Sam George is not punished according to law. Mm. And remember, parliamentarians enjoy certain immunity. I mean, they, I mean, they, they, you can't even just arrest them. And so, if an ordinary person is slaps, I mean, a member of parliament and a sitting member of parliament, and we are told that. Uh, the person should not be punished and mm. he might not be punished then we are opening the floodgates for mm. our Assault. members of parliament mm. you know to be assaulted during elections and when they go they, every now and then they have issues with their constituents but finally so do, do you have confidence in the, these recommendations do you have confidence that looking at this and the fact that we are just a few months away from the 2020 elections these are going to be good enough guidelines for the country, the security setup, the electoral commission, and the presidency for that matter, going into the elections? Well, well I think that uh, the commission did a very, you know, good work. And therefore, I am hoping and praying that the executive, the president, and his team 
would implement uh, the recommendations. The latter, if it is done and done well, then 2020, uh, we might not see this spectacle we saw uh, during the Ayawa's West Wagon by election. But you see, uh, if we have to go back into history, there mm. has been various uh, commissions, and uh, most of them were never implemented. But I'm hoping that the president has uh, the opportunity to, to lead us and make sure that these recommendations uh, are implemented so that 2020 we can all uh, be safe. Always a pleasure talking to you, Mr. Adams Bonafo. Uh, thank you very much for making time to talk to us as always. This is Midday Live on TV3. And um, just before we go, though, uh, some compensations have also been uh, recommended by the commission in that report that a few names mentioned in the report be compensated. And then also those who lost the vehicle, a woman we are told lost her shop. She's also supposed to be given some compensation. Go to 3news.com. That's our website. Details of this report would be found there. Stay with us. There is more to come. Thank you very much for staying with us. Uh, let's go on to some other stories this afternoon. And um, you know that we are on a campaign to draw government attention to some abandoned projects, some we are told as far back as uh, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's era or time when he was president. But for today, the one we are paying attention to, what our reporter is saying that it is bushy, smelly, it's a hideout for criminals and serves as a brothel. That is a sorry state of the Crowfrome market in Kumasi, which has become abandoned since 2008. The multi-purpose market has the capacity to accommodate about 5,000 traders, but the facility is yet to be completed 12 years on since work commenced. As part of the Fix Abandoned Projects campaign that TV3 is on, Beatrice Spiogabra visited the Crowfrome market and spoke to some of the interested groups. I am currently standing at the Crowfro Market. This market project started in 2007 by the former President Kofo under the Jubilee Project. If this market had been completed within that time, it would have served about 5,000 traders who were trading here and a lot more who would have been added. But since 2008, nothing has been done to this market. The structures here have started deteriorating because they have been left to the mercy of the weather. Weeds have also taken over the place. And as I'm standing here, the stench that is emanating from here is nothing good to write home about. Because aside the place being a brothel, as we are picking up from some of the people here, it is also a haven or a safe haven for some armed robbers and thieves. And occasionally, policemen come here to organize some soup here to clear them from the place. I have some of the residents or people who used to occupy here and carry out their trading activities here to speak to them on how they feel that after 12 years, this market project is still what it seems to be. Mr. Owusu, how do you feel that after 12 years, this market project is still as it is today? I'm going to phone on the video minus one. Say a person coming out, Nasa, and you bring up me Nimdia or much person, dear Gana for Omdia. If you say, Yania, yes, you can't can't cry Bob Wano, and you're Omdia San Yamo in a maya. Nas will be banners will be a yard, Dennis, your answer, and say, only Pacramba to us, no yard, Diano, and many power woman, Pantamona Zagana for your own first one. No more traction, no more for fro. A business as a CIA make up, make us say, and this buy and fear what she or my major who he, a woman bay or my cock. Uh, Nanado and Nakufa Dwaba. Well, by the first one month, two months, you will say, Great Abadoma. I will do Jano. Yen himself, Hallelujah. I bet to us all. And I have a watch you be doing. And to whom my just six months be out, that be a six months now, I'm saying. Obey any tea. Obey any be. Because the same number Pamia in a free house is CRD and chance is answer. So be the contract here on the kickback or contract on my don't chance to do your hanging now, but you're going to be a small sign. No, I don't know. You're going to be a little so you back at your what's here? You know, we said, we know, but by the big red, the best, yeah, great, 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 so be a mammy, and a day. A baby, Johnny Gooey, and then I bear ten years in me. No, Mrs. Sisman's in the basic journal. 
ali kwanso na maami ya bere watin afie me maami ya 2 years na be december na 2 years na so stay enye adwane mai de bia e be ya mai de bia be ya mai wo na ju twamu han me be je wo fon toilet ne yakona ha se obi wura mu a wura mu na e be pe wabo bo seven on dimi anta adwe mu ha se se me na ma be sha na e wo dwumu a ye tie kira ha se ye nto hwe e sika nyina ahye o ma ba so mba be ya mai so me ye mai tie sre na na do se o me ye mai wo yi kuma se dwuma ne wa ye 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 bu dwuma san ye be ye kejitia so ma ye kejitia nso ye nye dwuma mai se o ma ye dwuma mai if this market will also be left to rot, we leave it up to the authorities concerned. Beatrice Spiogabra, abandoned crow from market site, Kumasi. My heart bleeds when I see some of these things. And that is a market that could have accommodated 5,000 traders. Government is watching. We are also watching. We're staying in the Ashanti region because more than a decade after work commenced on the construction of the KNUST Teaching Hospital, the facility has been left to rot. The entire 71-acre land area for the state-of-the-art hospital has been consumed by weeds. Our reporter in the Ashanti region, Ibrahim Abubakar, joins us uh, at the site for an update on the current state as it is. In July 2007, the Asante 24 said to do the second cut sword for work to begin on this 800 bed teaching hospital of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. The project was scheduled to be completed in six years and was to be financed jointly by the university and the Ghana Education Trust Fund at a cost of $125 million. But 12 years down the line, the project is yet to see the light of day. The site has been taken over by wits due to years of neglect. The project, when completed, will come with a cardiothoracic and neurosurgical centers, administration and OPD blocks, diagnostics units, laboratory, several theaters and what's among other facilities. Former President John Dramani Mahama in 2016 gave the assurance that he would seek funding to complete this project. But that promise is yet to be fulfilled. As you can see, the project has been left at the mercy of the weather and some portion of it have begun to rot. KNUST authorities say the completion of this teaching hospital will enable them to double the intake of medicine students since there will be enough space for clinical and laboratory tests. Again, the completion of this project is expected to enhance healthcare delivery in the Ashanti region, thereby lessening the burden on the Confanochi teaching hospital. We will be finding answers from authorities why this project has been abandoned and update you in our subsequent bulletin. Ibrahim Abubakar, TV3, KNUST. What hurts me the most is that that is my money, that is your money, that is the taxpayer's money being left to rot away. Then a new project will be started and then also left to, to, to abandon and then also goes bad. Well, that is not all. We are keeping our eye, our eye on that. And now this time around, let's come to the Greater Accra region because a Community Day e-block school project started by the S12 Mahama administration in the Ashima municipality has also been left and neglected. The project has been left unattended to since 2014. Justin Frimpong visited the site and reports. Ashaiman municipality, there are several educational projects which work has stored on them and abandoned. One of them is the e-block project which you find right behind me. Well, since 2014 that a contractor walked off from the site, that has been the end of the story. Construction of the e-block was a source of joy for residents in the municipality when work began. It was one of the 200 designated e-block schools that were to be put up nationwide to enhance the progressively free education policy. Work commenced steadily, reaching 51%. But after 2014, work halted and the school project totally abandoned. The joy of residents, however, fizzled out after that. The 24-unit classroom structure and its associated external works 
are deteriorating. The buildings became a habitat for squatters months back until officials of the Ghana Education Service evicted them. And this officials of the Education Directorate, who won't speak on camera, noted they want it to be completed. In May 2018, the Member of Parliament for the area, Ernest Nogwe, took up a fight to get government to resume work, with him raising the issue twice on the floor of Parliament. But the claims all fell on death years. Megazillion was awarded a contract in May 2014, but the contractor, we were told, had travelled out of town. The abandoned e-block project was structured to take in fresh students from the Ashaiman Vocational Training Institute and enroll them in the Free Senior High School SHS policy. This is what we have just found touring the entire facility and it is a banner which have been hanged by Adams GH. It was done on 20th August 2019. It has a message on the banner. It says, Mr. President, complete the e-block schools and abolish the double track system. This message is so clear and it ties in in our advocacy role to alert government or draw his attention to resume to work and complete the abandoned projects. We made further checks with the Ashaiman Municipal Assembly for some answers, but the MCE was not available. Josephine Frempon, TV3 News. This is still Midday Live on TV3. So if you see any abandoned project anywhere, do send it to us and use the hashtag um, fix abandoned projects. Hashtag fix abandoned projects. And do tag us as well on our various social media platforms. On Facebook, it is TV3 Ghana. And on Twitter and Instagram, it is at TV3 underscore Ghana. Stay with us. There is more to come. All right, so before we go to that break, though, let me bring you one final story. A community day senior high school at Bokrum in the Bono region has also been left abandoned. So very sadly, the facility was part of a designated 200 e-block schools that were to be put up nationwide to reduce the pressure on existing senior high schools in the country. It is clear that government contracted a loan of $300 million to implement the Community Day Schools project. The people of Boku, a rural community in the Wenchi municipality, were filled with joy when work began for the construction of a Community Day SHS in 2016. However, the joy of the people fizzled out when the project was abandoned. Yeah. The 24-unit classroom structure and its associated external works have been taken over by weeds. All construction equipment and machines at the projects the site are rusty, while a power generator has also been left at the mercy of the weather. The only person who was present at the project site at the time of the visit was the caretaker Jacob Double. He said ever since he was employed by the contractor of Weber Construction Company a year ago, he had been paid only two months' salary. Jacob Double expressed concern non-payment of his wages is affecting his ability to cater for his family. I am not being paid. I have to drink rain water because I cannot afford to buy water. I am in a difficult situation. The watchman said apart from the contractor who sometimes comes to collect some blocks, no pilfering has taken place. He says his health is not only endangered by mosquito and snake bite, but he gets frightened by the outbursts of gunshots in the evenings. I have to keep vigil at night, otherwise thieves will come and steal the construction materials and equipment. The new school block, when completed, will serve Boku and other 19 adjoining communities. This is still made alive. We take a quick breather. When we return, we have some more stories coming up for you, including business, sports and entertainment. Stay with us.
Thank you very much for staying with us. Let's do business now. The owner of defunct UT Bank, Prince Kofi Amwabing, says he takes full responsibility for the failure of the bank. Speaking in an exclusive interview with TV3 two years after the collapse of the bank, Mr. Amwabing said that as a director of the bank, every attempt was made to salvage the dwindling fortunes of the company. The other things that we're doing, corporate responsibility and all those things, all these things were going to go away. And one thing that I don't understand is here's a government that says, I'm coming to create jobs. And you take actions to actually send people home before you create the jobs. I don't get it because I think the sensible thing is to see how you can contain as much as possible part of what you, is already created and add to it. But the unintended consequences would have been far more you know, disastrous than what we saw. This is the most disastrous uh, uh, approach they, they, they adopted. Because we owe the government 800 million. The closing of UT Bank cost this country at least 2.2 billion. Now, we had an investor who says, I want to take over UT. And he actually put down money's token to show that they are interested in it. And the first of all was, we'll pay 400 of the 800 and Bank of Ghana write off the 400. Now, we're even negotiating with them to say that we'll pay the 800, but give us more time to pay the 800, and then we'll take over the bank. The interesting and funny thing is that Bank of Ghana, behind us, wrote to our investor to tell the investor one week to the closure that they didn't like their offer. That is not Bank of Ghana's investors. They have no relationship with them. And they did not even copy us. And the investor felt Oh, since he's been written to, we must know. So it's as if some plan was hatched to spring a surprise and to just... Do you believe that some plan was hatched? I'm, I don't have time to think about those things. Mm. I don't bear grudge. What has happened has happened. You mm. see, one thing is, this country is more important than UT or any other company. And the, comp and the country has been given to people to govern. I only hope and pray that whatever action that they take is in the best interest of the people. When I was running UT and building up beauty, I had to sack my own brother for the sake of the general good. So I'm not worried about UT going down. It's just the process and probably the motive, suspected motive around it. But hey, the government says, I don't need UT, and Ghana is going to be better off. Hooray, we pray for the government to do what is right. All right, so that'll be it for Business on Midday Live. Let's turn our attention to some other stories. Now, the Ghana National Education uh, Campaign Coalition, that's GNEC, is raising key concerns with how the computerized school and selection uh, placement system has been implemented this year. They are raising issues with the transfer of key staff of the Secretariat, which uh, has led to some of these challenges that we are seeing. And you'll know that um, in the last few days, there have been so many uh, complaints and lots of people gathering uh, the independent square to try and get placement for the awards or correct what uh, anomalies they thought uh, had occurred in the placement of the awards. Let's come in studio and uh, have a, a little chat with uh, Kofi Asari. He's the executive uh, council. Uh, chairman for the GNEC. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much for your time and joining us in studio. Yeah, you are, are raising concerns about the the, um, the shifting or movement of key staff. How is that playing into the problem we are facing uh, with the placement of wards into schools? Well, we made um, a lot of observations um, after the event of last week and this week. And we found out that one of the issues is the attrition, you know, attrition of staff there. Because that secretariat is a very, very important um, unit. Um, it's probably second most important after the electoral commission system. And so mm. it's important to always maintain um, human capital there because the state will invest in them, upgrade their skills so that they can continuously deliver. You, you doubt that there were people who could have been trained to replace these persons who have been moved? Some people have been moved onto different shadows, and then we, we know how it works. You know, I mean, the fact that whatever political administrations change, certain people are moved here and there isn't an issue for discussion or for dispute. Mm. But the point I want to make is that there's a, there's a need to insulate that unit, the, the CSSPS unit, from any influence mm. and ensure that it becomes an autonomous institution 
that has capacity, retains capacity to deliver its service. Well, what are some of these influences you're looking at? Because we, I mean, the conversations that have gone around, there's a bit about, uh, you know, people who have executive order and then passing through the system behind the Do you think it's one of the influences? The place is a unit. I mean, it's not even a division of the genius, you know. Okay. It's, a, it's a unit, you know, it's not even a division. And so, perhaps it is time for us to elevate it to a level that uh, makes it more insulated, makes it more autonomous. Uh, yeah, autonomous and then makes it respond to a higher authority. There used to be a technical working group which had oversight directly over the unit. I'm told that um, it is no more functioning. Yeah. And so we are saying that it is important for us to look at all this. Look at, let's look at the operational framework of the Secretariat. Okay? And think through and see that as we implement the free senior school program, which has obviously come to stay, which is a very good policy, we should understand that one of the essential drivers is the placement system. system. Yeah. If the placement system doesn't work properly, it will affect the efficient implementation of the program. Have you, have you sought to maybe draw government's attention to some of these recommendations so at least we do not have a recurrence of what we've seen in the last two years? Exactly. That's why in our last paragraph, we indicated that we want a full-scale investigation to be conducted at the ministerial level into the event of last weekend this week. We, we admit that it's not the first time, but the scale makes it more an issue. And for me, an opportunity for us to say, look, let's stop and think. Let's review this system. This is where we've got into the 14 years. Now we are having a, a, a wider coverage um, program, right. the free senior school policy, about 500,000 students getting on board every year mm -hmm. as we progress. And so what can we do to strengthen the efficiency of the system, and grant it more autonomy, and make it more effective? In every country, in every society, such, such, such things are done. Right. And so we are prompting the, the, ministry, the ministry that this is time for us to begin to put together a committee, investigate what happened, right. make recommendations, and the recommendations should lead us into a conference where we will discuss the future of the computerized school placement, placement uh, secretariat. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Kofi Asar is the executive director of GNEC and uh, executive chairman, I beg your pardon, of GNEC, and uh, we've been trying to put into perspective how we can better resolve the issues of the school placement system. In entertainment news this afternoon, in August this year, veteran musician Bessa Simons was appointed to lead Musica as acting president pending a court case. Um, he may have been given the green light to act as president, but Bessa still wants the lawsuits initiated by fellow presidential contender Ras Apia Kaleb to be settled out of court. I must say, I mean, the elections going to court is not going to help anybody. It's not going to help Musica, it's not going to help me, it's not going to help my opponent, it's not going to help any aspirant. I wish we can all support in taking the case out of court, settling it amicably, and Musica moving on. If we can do that, that will help. Have you approached the rascal table this before him and what was the reaction? Oh, I mean, we had an executive council meeting, he was there, we all agreed that this is the way forward, out of court. Yes. Out of court. So we, we set some committee, they're going to meet, you know, and work on it, you know, towards um, ADR settlement. But I mean, something else happened, you know, which I don't know what triggered that, but I mean, hope we can get it back on course and then make sure music has succeed. One key policy that you touch when giving the nod. Um, I want unity. Because without unity, we're going nowhere. Even people who want to help Musica, because we are so much divided, they feel reluctant to help Musica. We have to unite. And what I will say is that I've seen so many divisions, disunity in us. And I will encourage people and appeal to them that this is not the time to take sides. This is t the time to support Musica. You know, for us to. Uh, Disunity from where? From, I mean, because when we had the campaign going on, people who were supporting each side were, you know, having a go at, you know, like campaign, like yeah, the way they campaign in Ghana. So now I think we should hold on with the campaign a bit and then support Musica, make sure Musica get what it needs until such time that the courts will make a decision. 
All right, so that's it for the bulletin. It came your way from uh, our studio here at Adesanwe in Accra. Thank you very much for watching. My name is Martin Asidu Dati. There is more news on our website, 3news.com. We we'll have a good afternoon. As always, stay positive. Bye for now.